Good evening. I'm Venki Ramakrishnan, the current president of the Royal Society. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to what I hope will be the first of conversations between scientists and people from the arts and humanities uh, to discuss broader issues of science and society. Tonight, our guest is Stephen Fry. We all know him as a great actor. He's appeared on many television programs uh, on, on the big screen. Uh, I myself, uh, who grew up with P.G. Woodhouse and Oscar Wilde and enjoyed his portrayal in Jeeves and Wooster and, and in the movie Wilde. Uh, he's also a widely read author who's written on a broad range of subjects, uh, ranging from humor to autobiography, uh, and most recently uh, about Greek mythology. And some of you may know him as something of a polymath if you've seen him on QI, but he's here today for none of those reasons. It is because he's a non-scientist with a deep interest in science and rationality and has engaged in conversation and debate with many leading thinkers, including Steven Pinker and Richard Dawkins. Uh, and that is one of the reasons that we really wanted him uh, to appear on this program. He's also consistently argued against superstition and pseudoscience. Now this brings me to the state of science today. Science is among the most trusted of professions. And today, science is more in the news than ever. Yet there's also widespread misinformation fueled by the growth of internet and social media. Many question both the motives and the conclusions of science and promulgate all sorts of nonsense ranging from the barely plausible to the outrightly bizarre. So it'd be nice to talk about the nature of science, how to combat misinformation, and how to build and maintain the trust that science has in society. So welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Venki. It's a real honor to be here. It truly is. The Royal Society stands for something very enormous in our culture. And um, while I know I'll never be a fellow, <laughs> I don't have what it takes. I don't have the chops, but it is something to be uh, under its aegis just for, a, for an hour. Thank you, Stephen. So let's begin with the nature of science. I think many people, uh, when they think about following the science or the scientific method, have a slight misconception. Scientists know that there isn't such a thing as the scientific method. There's no magical recipe. Rather, there's a variety, there are a variety of methods with different kinds of evidence, some of which may be stronger uh, and, and some not as strong. And I was wondering how you, as someone interested in science, perceive science. It's very hard to find a, 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 an all-encompassing definition. You're absolutely right. In terms of method, I suppose one can talk about uh, experimental science and, and therefore look at the difference between rationalism and empiricism, as the philosophers used to describe these two ways of approaching the truth. One by what you might call pure reason, um, which is the equivalent of, um, if you like, exper uh, non-experimental physics or pure mathematics, things that have no application in the real world but are abstracted and yet can be used to discover extraordinary truths. Um, and I personally have always loved empiricism. I've, I've loved, it's a very, it's a very strong part of the, of the British um, age of reason and enlightenment was that it was always palliated. The reason was always palliated by experiment. I, I like to think that, uh, you know, you have, and this is extreme, and you'll forgive me if you're French, but as a kind of image, you have a Pascal figure who has a piece of paper and numbers, and he has a theory of light, which is purely rational. And you have Newton, who takes a piece of cardboard and punches a hole in it and looks to see. And, and that is a very a very crude way of describing a difference in, in thinking, but it's, a, it's one that's always struck me as, as, as desperately important. And the way they both come together 
because they can seem to be very opposing. And it's often used in a psychological way to describe two utterly different character types, a rationalist and, and an empiricist. And rationalism can often be superstitious. It can often be something that works purely on its own outside the world. And empiricism tends to, uh, tends to call it out. In that sense, comedy is empirical and tragedy is rational, if that, if that isn't an absurd way of looking at it. You know, the comic spirit is always to test things on the anvil of experience. And characters like um, Hamlet, you know, just talk about ideas and things without ever really having the, 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 the common grounded sense. But yeah. I would say the two come together in my definition of science, which is humility before the fact. Yes, I think I think that I, since we are, this is a Royal Society event. Uh, it's interesting to point out that the, one of the strengths of the Royal Society was that it came down on this idea that it doesn't matter how beautiful a theory is or how important the person who uh, proposed the theory, but you know its motto is nullius in verba, which is on nobody's word. It's the evidence that matters. And I think that restored a very healthy balance between rationality and empiricism and, and allowed modern science to flourish so that you didn't have this imbalance uh, as, you know, as that's another way you might look at it. Yes, and, and the, the part of me that can't help but be uh, interested in drama and novel and personality, perhaps even over ideas, or at least who can only grasp ideas when they're mediated by personality, looks at a story like um, Ignaz Semmelweis. I was filming in Hungary and I was uh, able to go and find an Ignaz Semmelweis museum in Buda, on the, on the Buda side of Budapest. And um, he had long been a hero of mine because he, he was a true tragic victim of empiricism in the face of cruel rationalism. I'm sure you know the story. It's a very important one in the history of medicine, but uh, we, we, most of us know the story of John Snow, who, who, you know, locked the pump in Soho and proved that the miasma theory was wrong. And, and, and that was a great step forward again of, of empirical behavior. But Semmelweis was a, was a youngish uh, figure who uh, was faced with this terrible problem of women in parturition dying um, of sepsis, really uh, appalling numbers of them died in childbirth. And they were being delivered by medical students, but they were being, <laughs> their bodies, the, the babies were being delivered by medical students who had come straight from the dissecting room without washing their hands. But this is before germ theory. To us, it seems so automatically grotesque an idea, but right. nobody had thought that might might be in any way a connection. And indeed Semmelweis didn't particularly, he tried all kinds of closed off experiments, not exactly, you know, blind double, you know, random double blind trials, but, but as close to it as he could do, he controlled things. And one of them was to get a certain number of a, a cohort of these students to wash their hands. And, um, and immediately the deaths went down. You and I won't be surprised to hear. But the awful thing was, he suggested that, that it was something on their hands that was causing these deaths. And because microscopy and Pasteur and Koch and germ theory hadn't yet uh, arrived in the world, it, this was considered insane. And he was laughed, at, laughed to scorn, sacked, ended his life in an in insane asylum. I mean, it was a really dreadful story. Um, and, and he couldn't have been more right. And, and it, yeah. it seems to us extraordinary that, that because the, there was no evidence that these little invisible things existed, except the fantastic evidence of the drop in the death rate, it, it, its reason defeated epidemiology in an awful way. And, and you know, I, I, I think of that as a, not as an example of the arrogance of the existing science because they didn't accept it, but just of the, the, the split nature of the human way of looking at things in a way. We won't accept something that doesn't make sense to us, even if there is hard evidence, it seems. Yeah, and that, a, a very similar thing like, happened in the late 19th century when uh, Boltzmann, you know, the famous physicist, great, great, great proponent great. of at the atomic theory, 
but he was surrounded by people who thought the atomic theory was just a fiction, just a matter of, it was something the chemists just used as a convenience, had no basis in reality, people like Ernst Mach. And he was really hounded for quite some time before the community uh, realized that he was right and rallied around him. He, he committed suicide, but uh, he, that was for other reasons. He was mentally ill, yes. uh, but, but he, was, uh, he did face a lot of trouble. Uh, but it does goes to sh go to show you that rationality and empiricism, they have to go hand in hand because empiricism without an underlying conceptual framework uh, isn't going to get you very far. Uh, for example, you may know the death rates drop, but unless you know the underlying yeah. basis, you, you, yes. you, you can't go you, forward. Exactly, and, you, you stumble on the the distinction between a, a correlation and a causality. Exactly, and but so so they're both important. But what mm. what's interesting from your example is that they're not always in sync. Sometimes no. one leaps ahead and the other has to catch up. But there are very romantic times, stories when they are in sync, like Eddington going off yes, to Africa. Exactly, know. I was just about to say about the bending of light, yeah. you know, and, and of course, you could argue we're still testing uh, some of the predictions of relativity, for example, gravitational waves 100 years later. So, so sometimes they're well out of sync. And sometimes, as you pointed out in that beautiful example of the Eddington uh, expedition, uh, they can be uh, quite uh, closely in sync. Yes. So I want to come to another issue about science, which is uncertainty. So scientists always live with uncertainty. Uh, and doubt, as you know, is an intrinsic part of science. Uh, I'm reminded of a well-known senator who once ran for president named Edmund Muskie, who said that on his committees, he only wanted one-armed scientists because they kept saying, on the other hand. <laughs> And they, they could never give them give him a straight answer. And <laughs> yeah. Naomi Oreskes, the author of Merchants of Doubt, has pointed out how this very natural doubt that exists in science has been exploited by people like the tobacco lobby mm -hmm. or the fossil fuel lobby to Absolutely. argue against conclusions that are widely accepted by the science community. Absolutely right. And, and it and Sorry. in a recent debate, uh, you, Stephen, have argued against being too certain mm. and for passionate and positive doubt. Those are your words. And you also said, just because science doesn't know everything doesn't mean it knows nothing. Yes, that's right. Because that's one of the maddening things when, when you're having an argument with someone who is uh, doubting science and doubting a stack of evidence uh, when it comes to it, almost anything, they will say, well, science doesn't know everything. As if that's to say that it allows them to, to push open against science in every degree. Say, so, well, no, it doesn't know everything, but it knows a lot more than anything else knows. Uh, after all, science, the, 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 the origin of the word science is, is knowledge, scire, the, the Latin for to know. It is, a, it is about establishing what you can know and like any good philosopher, any good scientist realizes there are limits to what you can know, but there are nothing like uh, big enough limits to allow all kinds of nonsense to be said. And um, it is one of the great worries that the, I was quoting, I think in that debate, uh, Bertrand Russell, who, who, who said it is one of the sad things in the world that those, those people, you know, who are, who know, a lot and think a lot are filled with doubt and those people who are foolish are certain and it's a kind it's been refined in some ways into the, the now very well-known Dunning-Kruger effect for example that uh, the very nature of mental and cognitive incompetence is that it can't encompass its own incompetence it doesn't know how <laughs> stupid it is the problem with stupid people is they don't know they're stupid and smart people know the limitations of their smartness. So that allows bloviated uh, braggarts and diehards like, like the American president to behave as if they know everything when they know less, less than the, you know, the, the, the 
smallest and um, meanest uh, educated person knows, but uh, they, they are not in any way inhibited by an understanding of their lack of understanding, if you see what I mean, which is yeah. deeply worrying. And then on top of that, there is a cynical layer of quite, you know, quite able people who, as in the case of this, um, I forget her name, you, you quoted her, the, who, who, who I heard recently on the radio, talking about the, 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 the similarity, the congruence of, of the tobacco playbook and the, the fossil fuel playbook. The, the, exactly the same way of muddying the waters, of um, hiring somebody in white coats. In fact, I think the tobacco industry called it the, the, the Operation White Coat was the name of their first move in the 50s as it became apparent that smoking was, you know, the evidence was mounting up and up and up and up. Um, they called it Operation White Coat. Just get someone in a white coat whom you can pay um, and tell them that it is uncertain, that it's not quite clear yet. The evidence isn't all in, the jury is still out. And you can say this again and again about uh, anything. And at the moment, of course, it's being said about uh, climate change and uh, the anthropogenic nature of climate change in particular. Um, because people look at the medieval warm period and say, see, there are cycles. Um, and once you have to stop and go into the detail. Once you have to go, as the popular phrase is, granular, people are bored. They don't want to know anymore. They just like hearing the big rhetorical statements. And in the, in the 1950s and 60s, when C.P. Snow and F.R. Leavis had the famous two cultures debate, humanities versus science, um, as if they were you know, enemies and that there were two ways of looking at the world and one was correct and truthful and valuable and the other wasn't. And to Levis, the scientific method was cold calculating, it controlled human beings, it wasn't human shaped, it was abstracted and uh, it led to dark forces and dark outcomes. Whereas the literary and artistic way of trying to examine human impulse, human feeling um, and looking at uh, looking at that through the, the lens of an artist was something that only gave joy, you know, and they, they're both sides exaggerated naturally. I, I think we've got beyond that two cultures approach, but um, nonetheless, there is still out there in the world, a feeling that you can simultaneously appropriate science and dismiss it. So you, you use the word uncertainty, and of course that's a kind of um, double meaning in, in, in post, uh, you know, post new physics uh, uh, language because you think of Heisenberg. And, and, and so you can say, look, even, even quantum physics says the world is uncertain, uh, which is a total <laughs> misreading of what that's supposed to mean. Yes. Uh, and indeed, uncertainty is probably not the best translation. Of them. No. Yeah, but, but nonetheless, that's the word that's stuck. And so people say, you know, and, and look at chaos physics. There are nonlinear equations. Everything's turbulent and unknowable. So science is really sh proving that science isn't of any use. And yet the <laughs> most you know, ridiculous fraud selling crystals and so on, will use words like frequency and uh, energy, uh, which are words that have a very specific meaning in physics, of course, right. um, and, and will use them of, uh, of crystals when, and if you wanted to go and say, when you talk about this frequency, this crystal is giving out, they say, yes, I mean, do you remember your quartz watch telling the time that was giving out a frequency? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Does this mean that if I take a piece of rock and rub yeah. it, uh, you know, and the, and the, they're so slippery, yeah. aren't they? They're so there's, there's co opting of scientific <laughs> jargon yeah. uh, in contexts where they have absolutely no meaning. This is uh, something that scientists really, uh, I think, despise. Uh, but, but the real problem, getting back to uncertainty and doubt, is how to convey to the public that doubt and uncertainty are always a part of science, but it doesn't mean that uh, we don't know anything. Yes, it's, you know, it's and it's theory simply... doesn't mean that something is unsettled. You know, the yeah. theory of people, you know, for example, creationists will say, "Well, it's just a theory." Well, no, <laughs> no, that's obvious. That's right. not, yeah, a... that's the other thing. Theory as meaning something hypothetical, whereas we think of theory as a conceptual framework. Exactly, okay? and so uh, I think that is. So there, there are a number of issues. I, I'm not sure 
that I'm not sure how to make headway on this doubt problem. And I think it's, it is important. Uh, we're facing it, for example, now with climate change, but as I'll uh, come to later, we're also, it's also coming across with COVID, you know, various aspects of the pandemic and so on. And one thing is that eventually the truth wins out. Mm. No one now questions whether smoking causes cancer. Yeah. Uh, and despite years of sort of pushback. And so the question is, you know, how do we sort of accelerate that process? In other words, how do we, you know, it, it's mount an attack yeah. against the people who are, you know, obstructionists or, or really actually in some ways somewhat dishonest about uh, their claims? Well, um, you, p part of it is that if, if, if someone has an ax to grind or a political agenda to, 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 to put forward, they are nearly always a use trick of uh, in order to uh, to put their point forward and in, and to humiliate and to uh, discredit their opponents. So, for example, in politics, if someone won't change their mind, they're stubborn. Uh, but if you like them, they uh, they they show Im immense uh, stability and. Um, you know, so you could, if you disliked Margaret Thatcher in the old days, you would say she was stubborn and she just wouldn't change her mind. She was, she was a, like a like a donkey, just stuck there, wouldn't change. And others would say, say what you like about Maggie, she sticks to her guns. You know, so that's just a, an obvious example of how you use language. And similarly, scientists, if people want to discredit a, a science, then the scientists are either arrogant because they state something as a fact. And that they're, they're just arrogant, white-coated technocrats. Or if a scientist is kind of, as it were, makes the rhetorical mistake of being humble, then they can just simply get trampled over. So really it's about recognizing who the enemy is of the truth at, that, at any particular time. And obviously we have a, a serious enemies of the truth when it comes to medical science at the moment, which is something we're all thinking about in terms of the anti-vax movement, if you can call it a movement, um, and the idea that, you know, vaccination is a hoax, that COVID is a hoax, um, and that the, the, the epidemiological and virological ways of trying to explain it are hoaxes. But there are sciences that are halfway sciences. They're not pseudosciences, but they're sciences that take a long time to be accepted as sciences, in the same way that subjects get a long time sometimes to be accepted into universities, like economics took a long time before anybody would call it a science or a study or a discipline. Um, and one of the sciences nobody's talking about much at the moment, but which I know from friends in court, as it were, does have uh, seats in, on SAGE and other committees and therefore has the ear of, of, of government, it's not virology, it's not epidemiology or medical science generally, um, biology or chemistry or anything like that. It's a scientist, it's a science that we don't really think much of at the moment. It was discredited in the 60s and or late 70s perhaps. Um, and that's behavioral science of one kind or another. Now, what do we mean by behavioral science? Is it a mix of psychology and is it that kind of conditioning science of B.F. Skinner that, you know, involved mice in, you know, but as long ago as Sherlock Holmes in his second, uh, in the second novel, A Sign of Four, he says rather brilliantly, he says, you know, Watson, it's one of the most extraordinary mysteries that scientists can predict to an extraordinary order of precision how a mass of people will behave, how the average human will behave under certain circumstances. But nobody can predict what an individual is going to do. Yeah. And that is one of the subjects that, that behaviorology has to try and look at. Yeah, uh, it is a mystery. That's a very mystery. interesting point. I mean, when you're in theater, for example, and you're in a reasonably successful show, you know that on Monday, you'll sell between 40 and 50% of the tickets. On Tuesday, it'll be 60%, on Wednesday, 80%, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you'll sell out. Well, why is it that those individuals, some of whom go on a Monday, why don't the 40% who go on a Monday, why don't 
four weeks of worth of them all go on one Monday and it sell out hugely. And yet the averages do work out of individual mm -hmm. humans who are all captains of their soul with their own brains and decisions. They act in predictable ways and yet individuals don't. Anyway, the point well, is- Companies so, know this yes. well. Facebook and yeah. uh, other companies uh, know very well exactly how you know, we will behave on average and Precisely. advertising agencies. There's a lot of money at stake in, in so, this so kind good. of science. And as we know now, um, two behaviorology and psychology has been added in the past 20 years, um, game theory and all kinds of ways of modeling, nudging and behavior and, uh, and so on, which have been used in uh, financial markets as well as in uh, things like Facebook, as you rightly say, in order to, to predict human behavior and to nudge it, not just to predict it, but to, to some extent to control it. And, and this leaks over into politics, as we also now know, thanks to um, uh, Cambridge Analytica and uh, the Russian behavior and other interferences in, in the ways people vote and think about uh, subjects like who's going to be American president or should we or should we not stay in Europe. And, yeah. and here, a mixture of prediction and nudging and, and, and human uh, control has been used for enormous profit, either political profit or massive financial profit. Yeah, and that brings me sort of to mm. the next topic I wanted to uh, bring up, which is uh, misinformation in today's world. Yeah. You know, when the tobacco company did its uh, lobbying efforts, uh, there was no internet. Uh, but today, you know, we have the internet, we have the growth of social media, and it's a double-edged sword. I mean, children growing up in India or Africa can have access to the world's knowledge at their fingertips. But it's also fueled the growth of misinformation. You mentioned QAnon. QAnon has uh, acquired amazing followings, even among you know, Republicans. There's going to be a Congress. Congress. Exactly. So yep. uh, and you know, many of these people, and they, there are all sorts of conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. uh, you take something like COVID-19, it's a remarkable testament to the power of science. You know, just weeks after uh, the outbreak, people discovered the cause mm. of the virus, you know, yeah. and then they, they not only discovered the, the virus, but they were able to sequence it. They were able to get a test for it. They were able to identify modes of transmission and how to suppress it. They're on their way to trying to uh, obtain vaccines and drugs. Uh, when you compare that to HIV 40 years ago, that progress that we've had in less than a year uh, took almost a decade. Yes. And so, um, you know, science has done tremendously in this pandemic. Absolutely. But there are people yeah. I would who, say, who... I would say as a gay man who lost lots of friends that, that actually the, the HIV epidemic um, was instrumental in, in improving virology and epidemiology in incredible ways to do absolutely it. and we're, we're reaping the benefit yeah yeah you know, we're reaping the benefit of that but nevertheless yeah. you hear all these crazy theories about COVID-19 you know such as the whole virus is a hoax it was uh, artificially developed by China or alternatively by Bill Gates uh, or it was developed by the pharmaceutical industry because they want you to get sick so they can sell you things. And by the way, 5G makes you susceptible to this virus. And so we must destroy 5G infrastructure. Uh, this all strikes, uh, you know, to an average scientist, uh, this strikes uh, us as crazy. And uh, there's now a significant minority of people, the anti-vaxxers you mentioned, mm -hmm who say that, you know, if a vaccine comes along, we don't trust it, we're not going to uh, take it. And so I, don't, I wonder what you think, you know, first of all, what is your reaction to this? And what do you think we could even do about it? Well, my reaction is, as I suppose most people's ought to be, one hopes would be, is, is obviously horror and a sinking heart every time I, I pick up my iPad in the morning, which I keep stupidly by my bed and really shouldn't, and I look at the news. Uh, by the time I'm on my feet and ready for a shower, there's already hot lead leaking into my stomach as I think of the, the just the horror of the world. But I, I would suggest this, Venky, that... Um, 
science, I, do, do, do you, are you familiar with um, um, the idea of uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould's uh, Nomi, his uh, non-overlapping magisteria, as he put it? He was the son of a rabbi, and it it, it hit him very hard to try to, to be when science was aggressive towards towards religion and and claims that religion made, and he suggested that there should be non-overlapping magisteria, which is just a, a grand world for, for realms of inquiry, for, for areas of thought. In other words, science should stick to what science was good at and human, um, you know, whether you call it the humanities or the liberal arts or whatever culture you come from, those sort of things could, and religion can look after things that science shouldn't look after. But I think, and a lot of scientists thought he was, he was a bit nuts about that and that it wasn't right. And I, I agree that he wasn't right, partly because science has decided that it's not its job to look at things in the human world. I mean, apart from the human body, but it looks at things that are of nature, essentially. Uh, phusis, the Greek word is. And so every scientist is really a physicist. They're looking at phusis. They're looking at the laws of nature either in terms of biology and botany and geology, even the planet and, uh, and the cosmos uh, and the, 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 the laws of motion and uh, everything else that seem to, to, to cause the whole, the whole thing to work in, in the way that it does. But that human interaction and human behavior, uh, generally speaking, is a subject for non-scientists. Well, the problem is that a huge number of very clever non-scientists fill that space and are therefore able to, to pull tr triggers on human beings that they've discovered, uh, the kind of triggers that Daniel Kahneman, who won his Nobel Prize for identifying in, uh, in, in his uh, excellent book, you know, the, the cognitive bias, biases, the salience biases, all the biases to which we humans are prey to, uh, and of which we are mostly unconscious, and of which are two kinds of mind that he, 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 he you know, thinking fast and thinking slow is the book that, that kind of hit the, the, the popular presses and, and made him a, a, a dinner party chatterer hero. But that, that there's a lot of uh, extraordinary work that he did that shows that science can look at how people believe and why they believe and why they can be pushed into believing things that are untrue and why they find it hard to accept things that they don't want to be true. Uh, and all this is deeply important and is as subject to a rigorous scientific codification and explanation and a laying out as is the reason that leaves go red in October. Yeah, is this is the behavior, the growth of behavioral science. That's right. That and that's how I think that is part of it. I think scientists yeah. can't hold back and say, gosh, look how stupid humans are. They're not believing us. They should say, we've done, a, some scientists should say, we've done a lot of work on this. We know yeah. why humans are being like this. Yeah. And they should, and that should be open science. And in a sense, that is happening, but yeah. maybe there's, there's more to it. Uh, you know, it, it should... Yeah, I think, you know, your hero, Bertrand Russell, whom you mentioned, yeah. Yeah. Uh, used, to, used to talk about the infancy of reason. And the idea is that, you know, we all have a thin veneer of rationality, but deep down, we're actually quite emotional beings. Yes. And we, we come to conclusions often based on emotion, and then we try to justify it with reasoning or rationality after the fact. Absolutely. So we make a choice or form an opinion and then try to sort of rationalize it uh, later. And, and a very popular science now, of course, is evolutionary psychology. And that would say that we are right to be the way we are because we've evolved to need to respond very, very fast to danger, threat, or the possibility of a big lunch. And reason takes too long. If, if emotion can short circuit the journey, between yes, exactly. you know, problem and solution, then, then take it. Yes, so it, it leads to a question. So, you know, when scientists argue about the evidence or data, they, they often, as you say, uh, come across as cold and logical. Yeah. You know, uh, a bit like Spock, Spock exactly. or, or in the worst case, Dr. Strangelove. Yes. And, and so Naomi Oreskes, uh, you know, the person who wrote, um, Merchants of Doubt has come out with a new book called Why Trust Science. And she points out that maybe scientists really should 
uh, in order to connect with people, expose their humanity, that yeah. scientists are not uh, individually, we try to be objective, but as individuals, we fail to be objective. Science is objective because of the entire process of science, of keeping each other in check and providing sort of scrutiny by the community. But as individuals, we, we're human beings, we have egos, we have different motivations. You're uh, also subject that, to the pressures of academia and industry and whoever is sponsoring exactly. you. And she felt that if we were more sort of forthcoming about ourselves and our humanity and our motivation, we would come across as more authentic. Do you? Yes, do you I, I, funnily enough, I was going to come to exactly this point. Um, it, it's, it's as absurd for scientists to talk about the science and scientists as it would be for historians to talk about the history and historians as if they were a special class. And historians are just people who have looked further into history than most. And the history makes no sense at all. I'm following the history. Well, whose history? <laughs> what are your sources? What, you know, and the science, of course, is, must irritate scientists every time they hear a politician saying the science. Um, but you can see why politicians do. And, and because politicians are human as well. And scientists, yes, are human. They have two nipples and two legs, or they might have more, it's occasionally possible to have more than two nipples, of course, but you know what I mean. The, the point is we're all subject to the same pressures and thoughts and desires and guilts and, uh, and, and complexities. And one of, the, one of the things that scientists, just as people in the literary and the humanitarian and the, and the, sorry, the humanities need to be more aware of science, so scientists need to be more aware of, uh, of the humanities. And I think all scientists should, for example, read Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, where he sets out uh, very beautifully how the Greeks understood this. You talk about Mr. Spock in Star Trek, and of course, um, he, he said what, what the Greeks understood so, so clearly about themselves as this rather new civilization that had done remarkable things was that they were split between two principles that their own mythology gave them names for, the Apollonian and the Dionysian. In other words, Apollo, the god of reason and prophecy and truth-telling, the golden Apollo. They saw that as part of being Greek. They had given them the world music and rhetoric and logic and mathematics, all kinds of advances in those subjects. Um, but also Dionysus who was a god of frenzy and addiction and desire and letting go of your feeling and appetite and that they were just as much Dionysian as they were Apollonian. Mm -hmm. And uh, their tragedies, their plays, very often played out the contradictions in themselves between this. And if we think that the truth, either the human truth or even the truth of the world can be expressed by a human being who is exempt from these contradictions, these pulls in his own or her own personality, then they're fooling themselves because scientists desire things too. Uh, I, you know, I, I become rather obsessed by the story of Franz Haber, which you probably know is one of the most extraordinary stories of a scientist. And I think acts as a, there's a story that covers all of science. And um, he, he was a Nobel Prize winner because he, you could argue, was responsible for saving more lives and causing more people to be born than any human who ever existed. He, he was the, the man. The estimate is the world's population would be about half yes. what it is now without the Harvard process. Be because of his ability to, you know, to his, his, the way he found it to, to get um, nitrogen uh, uh, available for farmers and so on before they'd have to get guano from from South America and uh, bones from boneyards in order to to, to try and get uh, the, the nitrogen into the soil and increase the fertility of their crops and so on. And then, as you say, he, he's responsible for that. But um, then in the First World War, as a good German, he was also responsible for for for, for chlorine gas. For, for the gas attacks. He actually supervised them and went to the front and taught the men how to use the wind best in order. And he watched as, as French soldiers were shooting themselves in the head to, to commit suicide. Quite horrible. In order to stop the foulness of this burning in their throat. And his wife 
Who was, was a suicide. brilliant? She yeah. yes, she was a brilliant chemist herself, and she she went out and shot herself because she was yeah. so ashamed and horrified by what her husband had done. Who yeah. then went on after the First World War to produce this amazing new, uh, I suppose it complemented the nitrogen, a weed killer type poison um, that uh, they called cyclon, uh, which in German, of course, is zyklon, and um, it. Turned out that that, of course, was the poison that the SS used in the death camps to kill Harbour's family. That's right. The irony is he was Jewish exactly. and he did not want to leave Nazi Germany. He yeah. said, I'm a loyal yeah. German and you yeah. must, you know, accept that. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, the, yeah. And he didn't me. even stop then. He's, his legacy is still there because the Monsanto company used the same chemical that was in Zyklon for Roundup. And for the, you know, and it is, I, I don't know if you've uh, seen, uh, what's that documentary on Netflix? It's a very good one about, about the soil and about, uh, the, you know, the history of the degradation of the soil in the United States from the Dust Bowl onwards. And so mm -hmm. um, th there's an example of the fact that you cannot possibly, you know, you, you cannot possibly take science as a, as a pure thing. It's, it's as everyone knows, it's, it's application. And a pure scientist will say, oh, but that doesn't apply to me because... I'm not a technologist or an engineer or a, working for a factory making some product. I'm purely, I'm not wet science. I'm blackboard or, you know, whiteboard or whatever it is now, you know. Um, but that that doesn't quite wash, does it? Um, no. And it, it it's actually the harbor uh, anecdote you, you mentioned. It is actually a lesson that scientists also must learn uh, not to have the sort of arrogance of science, because science has become, been so successful and it's mm. such a, a very logical way of looking at nature and the world, uh, we mustn't forget the sort of human aspect of why we do science yeah. and what it means. I, I think that's I think, very important. Yes, I mean, if one wanted to start again with universities, would, you know, one, I think you know clearly ethics has has become more and more important a subject both in business uh, and in science. Bioethics is is, is obviously a, a, a very rewarding field, uh, a very important field as we move towards this tsunami of new technologies which we are facing, which we haven't been able to speak about yet. But that's one of the huge problems, and and maybe we can learn from history that. Something scientists have never been very good at doing in, in, in the larger sense is prediction. They can predict events, discrete events that are part of their scientific realm, and that is the, the, the prediction and repeatability of phenomena is part of what makes science work. It's part of the proof of science, of course. But if Galvano and, uh, um, and, and Volta and Coulomb uh, and, and um, Faraday and Thompson and, uh, and Maxwell, if they had all predicted what the effect of their beautiful theories and their wonderful science, and their marvelous mathematical modeling of this strange force, this, this electricity that was also seemed to be magnetism and yes, was both. And if they could see that as a result of that, would come technologies that would so transform the world and in some cases so impoverish areas of it as well as enriching others. I, I wonder what they would have said because no, how great their minds were and how logical the outcomes of electronics came, you know, as you move all the way up through to the Bell Labs and Shockley and the transistor mm -hmm. and these extraordinary developments. Um, and then of course, computing and right up now to the possibility of, of quantum computing. And uh, I think Faraday though did have an inkling because I, I forget whether it was the prime minister or the, or, or the queen, Queen Victoria, who asked him, what good is this? And he said something to the effect that, well, one day you may tax it. Of course, he may, not, <laughs> you know, he may not have realized that the tax could be in the trillions, you know, but <laughs> anyway, so. Um, Very true. But, but it, getting back to the, the yeah. trust question, mm. you know, mm. part of the problem is that some of the, the sort of things that people argue about, like the anti-vaxxers, mm. well, the, the uh, an anti-MMR paper was published in a mainstream journal, okay? 
before it was retracted. Oh, Andrew Wakefield, you mean? Exactly. Yes. And yeah. and similarly, there were there was a paper on GM crops, which also turned out to be flawed. Uh, there have been data on whether uh, high tension wires cause cancer. Each of these cases, there's been an initial finding. That finding has turned out to be flawed. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, lots of papers have discredited the finding. And yet the original flawed paper seems to live on yeah. because it was done in this sort of established way, you know, in a, published in a peer reviewed journal and so on. And so I, I think the public doesn't understand that there's a provisional nature of science. You could have a finding and that finding could turn out to be wrong and subsequent findings, uh, you know, is the mass of evidence uh, which, turn, which people believe in. And it's, it's very, very hard because there are often scientists, there's often a small group of scientists who will still insist that the original finding was correct. Yeah. There are still scientists who argue that cold fusion is correct, even though you know, it's been widely discredited. Mm -hmm. So I, I sometimes wonder how to tackle that problem and how to sort of restore faith in the consensus, trust in the consensus. And part of the problem is people will argue, oh, well, you know, Galileo was against the consensus and the consensus. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, or quantum mechanics. And they don't uh, realize that these are very, very rare. And that is why we remember them. They're revolutionary. And yeah. that is not how science it, works most of the time. There's also a misunderstanding that people think uh, the next generation of science overturns the previous one, that somehow uh, Einstein disproved Newton, um, right. uh, you know, and that uh, Niels Bohr and, 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 and others disproved uh, Einstein. But, but when it comes down to it, mathematically, there are differences of or, or almost unimaginably small amounts of d d decimal places in the in the results of of, of these two forms of physics, the, the, the so-called mechanistic Newtonian one, still holds. You can become a millionaire snooker player using only Newtonian mechanics. Exactly. After or all. design a car, yeah. you, you know, you or, or even a rocket. Exactly. You can't. Yes, you can. You can get, get back from on Apollo thirteen with a people people. Pe pe a pencil and paper uh, using a few Newtonian equations, as it were, and you certainly can't play quantum billiards, as far as I know, on a table. But, but, um, but nonetheless, yes. So there is there is this idea that scientists are going to change their minds anyway. That in fifty years' time there'll be another theory along which will disprove the previous one, which is, of course, not what theories mean and not how what the history of science teaches us. But it's very hard to to, to kick that out of people's minds. And the other thing is, of course. Uh, and this is part of what I said about the, the Daniel Kahneman business is that just as we can see the, 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 the bias in other minds, they can see the bias in ours or, or, or they think they can. So whenever you defend something like an established scientific consensus, people will always instantly want to read um, a purpose behind you or, 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 or big pharma. They'll say, oh, yes, that's because Big Pharma wanted. Because um, I mean, I've tried to explain to, to someone um, when, 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 when they said to me, of course, yeah, Big Pharma are going to go and rub their hands with joy when they find the vaccine. I'll go, well, actually, no. <laughs> You'd pro they'd probably make more money if there was no vaccine. <laughs> and over the years, people continued right. to get ill. The vaccine would actually very soon stop making them much money. <laughs> so, you know, it just doesn't even... You know, you, but once you start to argue like that, it's very difficult. And it's not only the arrogance of science, but it's, it seems almost the arrogance of knowledge of history and the ability to lay out an argument are under threat because populism is all about um, dismissing elites and experts uh, in all areas, not just science. Uh, in fact, science is a pretty safe one compared to those pesky, uh, you know, pesky people who've read books and, uh, and, and who follow up details and, and explain the truths about things and point out what was said yesterday that you, you're now contradicting. 
And as we know, as each month has passed, the populists and uh, and their mouthpieces are able to double down more and more in sh sheer denial and just say, I never said that. And we're now in a position, thanks to deep fakes, which work both ways, both they can make uh, a politician appear to be snorting cocaine off a prostitute's nipples, who was never near that prostitute, uh, and it looks totally convincing, but also they can allow a politician who really did snort cocaine off a, off a prostitute's nipples to say, that's just a deep fake, I was never there. You so know, that, nothing yeah. is stable anymore. Everything- no, that's, that's a terrible problem. Yeah. Uh, we, we, the kinds of evidence we relied on to establish facts uh, are, uh, are becoming more and more difficult to sort of uh, convince people. That's of. right. They're just part of the culture wars. If you are that kind of person, you believe that evidence. If you're that kind of person, you believe that. That's so it. what do you see as the role of the press? There have been a number, couple of questions on whether journalists understand the science they're reporting and are there enough science correspondents and has is the level of debate and reporting been of a high enough standard. And do you think, what, what, what in general do you feel is the role of the press in all this? There are, of course, some really good uh, uh, scientific journalists, and 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 we're you know we're all the the, the culture is a debt to uh, Ben Goldacre and Simon Charmer and people like that who've who've really uh, uh, increased the general public's understanding of what you might call good science and bad science, fake science and real science, and how to read it. And uh, the you know the BBC uh, has the uh, uh, program which which looks at numbers and how they really affect and analyzes and as it were, fact checks the, the, the claims and statistical counterclaims that are made by politicians. And so there is available a much, much greater access to the truth. But um, again, you have to want it. And it's very easy for, for us to say, well, we're the, what used to be called the chattering classes and are now called the, I don't know, the sneering metropolitan elite or whatever you want to call us uh, and and we're, we're unbearable to to a lot of people because uh because we pull down these theories or we want to erect ones they don't like or or, or we're dishonest or i don't know you know we, it's very easy to assassinate the character and the the you know the process of so, of someone who's your perceived enemy and and suppose the answer is is to try try and engage everyone in in some element of the of, of being part of building a beautiful picture that's true um and a true picture you know it's a bit like the old x-ray crystallography it took a hell of a long time it took those amazing scientists most of them women because men were too flighty to have the concentration skills to do it you know to to, to find these different angles and these different different presentations of the truth before a whole picture of a protein or whatever could be established. And it was a, an amazing, of course, now it can be done by machines in seconds, but but it, the point is, if, if you all felt that you were holding a piece of the jigsaw and that, that there was a way that different intelligences and different ways of looking at the world can contribute to, uh, uh, as I say, a, a kind of modeled, um, uh, multifaceted truth, it, it would be very helpful because I suppose part of the problem with science, and it certainly is for me, my father was a, a physicist and, um, and uh, so whenever I asked him a question, his usual instinct was to take a piece of paper and draw a vector and there was X and there was Y and there was a sort of <laughs> wave thing and, the, and on, the, on the top of the wave at some point he put um, X minus one in brackets and then squared uh, and, I, and I would immediately say but I don't understand. I just asked you why the sky was blue or whatever, you know. And you'd say, but don't you see? You know, and and there is this enormous gap. But, but, and, and you scientists who are who are tuned into this Zoom um, must probably know it's true, but I I don't think you understand how stupid we are when it comes to numbers. I mean oh, I, 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 you know, I, I I I think I doubt that. I think <laughs> I'm sorry to say ah, nobody's going to mistake you for I me. I can grasp an idea. But, I can read a book, but two pages later, I have to turn back to remind myself. That, that happens to, I think that happens to all of us. But mm. I, I want to get back to this point about people believing what they choose mm. and then automatically trying to discredit the other side. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if they don't like a, 
scientists' opinion or views or data, they will uh, start attacking the scientists. We've seen that even with the pandemic. You know, some of the epidemiologists are, are harassed Dr. on Fauci. Twitter. Yes, exactly. And Fauci, for example, yeah. Uh, yeah. has been really uh, badly, you know, and people are uh, issuing Good. death threats and, and things like that. And I, he, even in, in Britain, uh, you know, our uh, scientists uh, have often been attacked on Twitter, threatened, etc., and harassed. And so this is a kind of disturbing situation. And the question is, how do you convey to the public that, look, science is what it is, don't shoot the messenger. Is there a way that we can explain the motivations? And perhaps could we be more transparent about the incentives in science? Could we change the incentives in science so that people would trust scientists more? And this might involve a change in the science culture. You know, so it, it, it might. And I, I think that, that that's but part of it, and uh, I don't mean that the, the important questions of science should go unexplored and that you should reduce the, you know, the budgets of, of big science, things like, you know, um, the Hadron Collider or whatever. These are, they're all obviously immensely important areas of science that one wouldn't, as it were, touch. But in terms of the everyday interface of scientists with others within universities and within industry and within other uh, institutions and establishments and society generally, Things have been tried. The, the the chair of the public understanding of science in Oxford, for example, which is a brilliant idea, and unfortunately, and I say this because he's a friend of mine and uh, we have much in common. Uh, Richard Dawkins is probably the most famous holder of that chair, but he was a polemical figure, and people will always associate him with something. And um, and and those who found his, uh, you know, his dismissal of, 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 of religion in particular. So um, they found it uh, brittle and uh, angry and uh, ungenerous perhaps. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, and I mean this with greatest respect and love of Richard, that, that in some ways it held back what it was supposed to do, that far from increasing the yeah. trust and friendly nature of science, it, it only seemed to increase the... It is odd, you know, because in his writings, he comes across as much more strident Absolutely. than he is in person. In person, he's, and he's very courteous and, and you know, charming almost. And he's warm and he's open to the mystery yeah. and the wonder of the world which you know he'd be an idiot if he weren't so the idea that he's a cold rationalist is of course nonsense but uh, yeah it's it's uh, but but one shouldn't sort of rest it all on 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 him in that sense. I think um, you know it's been tried when I was a boy and still going on the Royal Institute Christmas lectures and the, but you know it was always the goody two-shoe blue peter watching middle class children who sat there with their shiny faces laughing and enjoying the experiments that were being shown to them and uh, uh, somehow uh, something else has got to happen and, and I'm trying to you know I can't I can't give an answer here and now as to how science is going to be integrated into, into the public discourse in a way that allows, uh, you know, a, a reciprocal understanding of science and uh, across cultures and so on. Um, because, well, one thing I think scientists can do, and that is be better prepared for what is coming. I, uh, the image I have is we're looking out to sea, which picks up on Newton's idea of being a beachcomber, perhaps. We're looking out to sea, and there are upswells on the horizon of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different complete separate technologies which are converging into one tsunami. Uh, and they are nanotechnology and uh, uh, biotechnology, gene editing, genomics, you know, CRISPR and so on. Um, a brain machine interfacing, um, uh, quantum computing, new materials, graphene and all the others. Um, and, and of course, artificial intelligence, um, unsupervised machine learning and, uh, uh, and robotics and, uh, and, and so on and bio augmentation. Uh, all these are coming together uh, and are on the horizon. And, uh, and it won't be long before suddenly that huge tsunami is over us and each one of these technologies is capable as being as 
wickedly used for ways that are not good for human polity and comity, if I can use those words, um, as the internet was or as social media was. But together, the possibilities are terrifying. And I would have said 10 years ago, they are blissful. Look how wonderful it's going to be. But now I'm so doubtful because the fact that all science and technology can cast a shadow has never been clearer. It, and, and often the brighter and better it is, the starker the shadow that, you know, so, I mean, in the late 90s, late 80s and early 90s, when I when I joined the internet as a, almost like a kind of radio ham, it was just a, an amateur hobby. And Tim uh, hadn't even invented the, Tim Berners-Lee hadn't even invented the, the World Wide Web yet. And I saw this thing and I imagined how it was going to break down borders and dissolve differences. And it would be a, a, a huge university for everybody, a, a resource, a library, a museum, a theater, a concert hall, a public square. It would be the most, wonderful thing that humanity had ever created and it would end our problems and at some yes. point the reverse happened yeah and, and that is a you know and I of course I feel stupid but should I have guessed well I don't remember I read almost every book on the internet there was to read in the early 90s which was only about three a year and not one of them said look out it's going to be dangerous nobody no. the dark That's side true. well and I, I think it's a lesson that perhaps scientists should not just remain disengaged, yeah. but when technologies develop, we have to carry society along. We have to uh, get them involved, get them to understand the technology. And often they will have, they will see things that we perhaps very in our very narrow technical ways uh, might not. And, and, they, and also what people do with technologies and new science is really a social uh, problem. It's a it's a matter for society to decide, not just for scientists uh, yeah. to decide. And perhaps that's the only way uh, we can sort of tackle this tsunami is by really engaging broadly with the public and bringing them along, and mm. and and dealing with it collectively. I I, I think that's probably uh, going to be more and more needed. Uh, yeah. as, as these things develop. I mean, genome editing, machine learning, those are two very classic cases where society will have to decide how these things are used, yes. not, just, not just the people who develop them. And of course, we're no longer in the sort of situation that uh, uh, the world was in in the 1930s, where Oppenheimer and Einstein could write to the president and inform him of a technology of which he was never aware and give him the terrible choice as to whether or not to yeah. press the green light uh, for, for it to go ahead and, and the atom bomb to exist. Uh, we all, you know, we all know, you know, uh, th that CRISPR editing exists. We know that machine learning exists and we know that there is no locus of authority. There's no equivalent figure who can say, yes, this is a wise thing and we should do it. And no, this is a terrible idea. We mustn't do it because different nations will do things there's no consensus around the world there's no belief in international organizations or the very nature of internationalism um yeah. and and so for example at a university one might imagine that a solution to such a thing and you could widen this out is that in the same way that if i were to write a novel that involved some scientific ideas I would send the manuscript to the physicist, the biologist, the geneticist, you know, the various disciplines that the book tried to write about and say, does this make sense? And they would say, well, it's a bit, uh, no, that's not really how it would be done. And, <laughs> oh yes, that's kind of right. And so yeah. on. And similarly, if a scientist has an idea, has, a, has made a breakthrough, naturally they publish it and peer review happens and so on. But, in the old days, it would be that uh, Hardy and, uh, Hardy and uh, Whitehead or something would go and see Wittgenstein or G.E. Moore or, 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 or Russell, of course, and say, is there a philosophical, ethical problem with this? Is this a bad idea? And, and, and you know, you'd trust a scientist to say, uh, this is what it is, and I can explain it to you. And you'd trust a philosopher to say, 
you do realize that when people get hold of this, they will want to do that with it or that it's possible, you know, because most of philosophy these days is what's called consequentialism, isn't it? It's a, the, you know, the modern fancy word for utilitarianism that, that almost all morality and ethics is predicated on its consequences. Is it you know, are the consequences good or bad? And that's how you judge morality, not by some external thing like God or conscience, but, uh, but through consequences. Well, actually, consequence, consequentialism should also be put into all scientific breakthroughs and ideas that the consequences of new ways of thinking new models and and apprehensions of the world, new discoveries, um, the consequences should be thought through. And I don't mean you can never ban (laughs) a new thought or a new, there's never in the history of technology as a new technology not being taken through. And and so you can't, you know, you can't sit on it, but you can maybe have an element of understanding that it doesn't exist in isolation as a pure scientific model or idea, but that once it's out in the world, just as a pure gas will, it will mix with the atmosphere of the human atmosphere and become something else. And, you know. Well, this has been a fascinating hour, at least for me, uh, Stephen. So I want to thank you again for agreeing to do this. And I hope Uh, those of you who've listened have enjoyed it as much as I have. So thank you, Stephen. And a real pleasure, Venki. And thank you. And thank everybody for tuning in and uh, good luck everybody and keep fighting the good fight for truth and honor and the scientific way. (laughs) Good night. Good night all. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye.